This lecture is part of Berkeley Math 115, an introductory undergraduate lecture on number theory, um, and will be mostly about the Chinese remainder theorem. So um, this is about solutions of congruences. Um, so I'll just quickly um, review solutions of linear congruences. So suppose we want to solve a congruence AX is congruent to B modulo m, where a, b, and m are given. So we saw in the discussion on Euclid's algorithm that this is solvable um, if and only if um, b is divisible by the greatest common divisor of a and m. So this is obviously necessary, and Euclid's algorithm shows that it's sufficient. Um, so let, let's just do a quick example. Suppose we want to solve 6x is congruent to 7 mod 45. And this is no solutions, because if we look carefully at this, we see that um, this 45 is divisible by 3, and this 6 is divisible by 3. So um, um, if there were a solution, then 7 would also be divisible by 3. So, so, so um, this particular case is no solutions. Now let's try 6x as congruent to 3 mod 45. Well, here you see um, now that uh, now this number is divisible by 3, so there should be a solution. And how do we find the solution? Well, we just write 6x equals 3 plus 45y. And we can take out the factor of 3 just to make things simple. It's not really necessary, but... So we get 2x equals 1 plus 15y. And now we can solve by Euclid, which I'm not going to write out in detail. And you can just find x is congruent to 8 mod 15. Of course, with an example as small as this, it's faster just to do by trial and error rather than by using Euclid. Um, now, one thing you've got to be a little bit careful of is you can ask how many solutions there are. And you may say, well, 2x equals 1 mod 15 only has one solution mod 15. However, in the original equation, notice that this is three solutions mod um, 45. Um, but the point is, if you've got one solution x, then you can just add 15 to it, and we still get a solution. So we've got 8, 8 plus 15, and 8 plus 30 as three different solutions. So this is something you've got to be a, a, a little bit wary of. Um, so if a and m are equal to 1, so if a, sorry, if, a, if the highest, greatest common divisor of a and m is equal to 1, then this means the solution is unique and always exists. If a m is greater than 1, the solution might not exist. Or there can be many solutions. Um, so that's something you always got to um, be a little bit careful of. Um, so more generally, we would like to solve the prob following problem. Suppose we want to solve f of x is congruent to 0 modulo m, where we might take f to be a polynomial in x. For instance, we might want to solve x cubed is congruent to 5 modulo 60. Um, and the idea of doing this is to split it into several cases. So the first case is m is prime. And this tends to be a sometimes a bit easier. Um, this is because um, if a m um, um, equals 1, then a has an inverse. And since m is prime, this means that either a has an inverse or um, a is congruent to 0. And um, this makes things a lot easier because most elements have inverses. Um, so the second case is m is equal to p to the n is a prime power. And what we will see is 
that this can be sort of reduced to the pre to the case m equals p. And we will be discussing this a bit later in a, in a later lecture. So the third case is m is arbitrary. Um, well, here we can write m is equal to p1 to the n1, p2 to the n2, p3 to the n3. And for this, we're going to reduce to the case m equals p to the n using the Chinese remainder theorem that we're discussing in this lecture. So there, there, there are three steps to solving fx equals zero mod m. You do your general case reduced to prime power, prime power reduced to prime, and then you solve a case of um, prime. And this lecture, we're going to be looking at um, the reduction of case three to case two. And later lectures, we'll be um, um, studying these two problems. So um, what we need to do is to be able to solve two different congruences. So um, let's look at the following problem. Solve. We want to solve um, x is congruent to a1 modulo m1. Well, uh, that's not very difficult, but we also want to solve x is congruent to a2 modulo m2. And we want to find the same x solving these two equations. So, so can we always find a solution? Well, let's try x is congruent to 1 mod 6, x is congruent to 2 modulo 10, and try and find a solution. Well, um, that's not going to be very easy because this equation here implies x is even, and this equation here implies x is odd, so there are no solutions. So in general, if we've got two linear equations with different numbers m1 and m2, um, we can't generally solve it. And you see the problem here is, is the fact that these two numbers have a common factor of 2. So, so this one can imply that x is something mod 2, and this one can imply that x is something completely different modulo 2. Um, and this suggests we should be able to solve these um, if m1 and m2 are co-prime. Um, so, so let's just check this. So we want to solve x is equal to a1 plus m1 y1 um, equals a2 plus m2 y2. And now all we have to do is to solve this equation here and that gives us x and if we um, um, if we look at um, um, this equation we can see it just says m1 y1 minus m2 y2 is equal to a2 minus a1 and now we can this is just a linear equation for two variables that we that has a solution if m1 m2 um, are, are, are co-prime. So if we want to solve two linear equations in in some unknown, we can do it provided we, we, we're provided all the moduli we're working with are co-prime to each other. Um, if they have a common factor, we, maybe we can solve it and maybe we can't. And if we can solve it, there might be several solutions and so on. Um, um, we also notice that this solution is going to, if m1 and m2 are co-prime, the solution is unique modulo m1, m2, if m1, m2 are co-prime. That's because um, we're saying x is congruent to a1 modulo m1, and x is congruent to a2 modulo m2, and if we've got two different x's, the difference of two solutions satisfies, let's write y for the difference, y is congruent to 0 modulo m1, y is congruent to 0 modulo m2, and these two imply y is congruent to 0 modulo m1, m2, because m1 and m2 are co-prime. So as, as long as m1 and m2 are co-prime, that, 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 that there's a unique solution, modulo m1, m2, of these two equations here. So let's just do an example. 
Suppose we want to solve the following two equations. x1 is congruent to 1 mod 17, and x is congruent to 3 modulo 21. All we do is we write out x is equal to 1 plus 17y is equal to 3 plus 21z. Um, um, so we've got the linear equation minus 21z plus 17y is equal to 2. Um, so we use Euclid to solve minus 21z plus 17y is equal to 1. And this has the solution z equals 4 y equals 5 so we just double it and this has the solution z equals 8 y equals 10 and this gives us this if we just substitute in here we find that x is equal to 171 so solving two linear equations with co-prime modulus is is easy and fast what happens if we've got three equations um, so we've got x is congruent to a1 modulo m1, x is congruent to A2 modulo m2, and x is congruent to A3 modulo m3. So what do we do? Well, um, obviously we would like m1, m2, m3 um, a pairwise co-prime. What this means is that m1, m2 are co-prime, m2, m3 are co-prime, and m3, m1 co-prime. Notice that this is stronger than saying that m1, m2, m3 have no common factors, because, for example, if we take m1 is equal to 6, m2 is equal to 15, and um, m3 equals uh, 10, then these two num three numbers, m1, m2, and m3, all, all three of them, th th there's no common factor of all three, but any two of them have a common factor. So, so you mustn't confuse being pairwise co-prime with, with all of them being co-prime. Um, so this, th this isn't the condition we want. We want, we want this stronger condition. Um, and what we can do is we First solve the first two equations, and then we get the solution x is congruent to something or other modulo m1, m2. And we've also got the equation x is congruent to a3 modulo m3. And now we've got another two equations, and now m1, m2 are co-prime to m3, so we can solve these and get x is congruent to something modulo m1 m2, m3. So we can solve any number of linear equations with um, provided all the moduli are pairwise co-prime just by repeating the case for two elements. Um, and um, we can give an example. Um, this is where the name Chinese remainder theorem, that there's a Chinese mathematician, and I'm not going to try and write his name in Chinese or to pronounce his name in Chinese. So he was apparently in about the third century. And he had the following problem. He said, there are certain things, there are things whose number, whose number is unknown. And um, if we count by threes, Um, there are two left over. He said if we count by fives, we have three left over. And if we count by sevens, there are two left over. And um, you know, he had to write everything out in words because um, algebra was in a rather primitive state at the time. But what he's obviously saying is we're trying to solve the following three equations. X is congruent to 2 modulo 3. X is congruent to 3 modulo 5 and x is congruent to 2 modulo 7. So what we do is we first solve um, these two equations, and 3 and 5 are co-prime, so that's um, easy, and we're just trying to solve um, 2 plus 3y, x is equal to 2 plus 3y equals 3 plus 5z, and here we've got something we can solve 
by either by Euclid's algorithm or by guessing. And we can, for example, um, take y equals 2, z equals 1. And in, in small examples like this, it's much faster just to guess the solution than to try and remember what Euclid's algorithm is. So we find x is equal to 8 would be a solution for the first two. So these two now become x is congruent to 8 modulo 15. And you notice this 15 comes from the product of 3 and 5. And of course, you can't fix x to be 8 because this won't satisfy the first equation. You've got to, you've got to allow x to um, um, have multiples of 15 added to it. Now we take these two equations and solve them. So we now want to solve um, x equals 2 plus 7y. That's nothing to do with the y over here. Equals 8 plus 15z. And again, if you look here, we've got a linear equation in one unknown and um, um, y equals minus 6, z equals minus 12 would be a solution if I've got this right. So we get x equals minus 82. And now we can add multiples of 3 times 5 times 7 to it. So we can add 105 times anything. And we can find a positive solution, x equals 23. So you can see x equals 23 is now 2 mod 3, it's 3 mod 5, and it's 2 mod 7. Um, um, I can give an alternative, more abstract proof of... Um, uh, 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 of the Chinese remainder theorem. So this is a sort of alternative proof. So what we're trying to do is, is show that we can solve x as congruent to a1 modulo m1 and x as congruent to a2 modulo m2. And we want a solution modulo m1, m2 whenever m1 and m2 are co-prime. And instead of using Euclid's algorithm, we can, we can just count. So what we do is we write down all the numbers 1, 0, 1, 2, up to m1, m2, minus 1 here. And there are m1, m2 of these. And we write out all the numbers from 0 up to m1, minus 1 here. And there are obviously m1 of these. And we write out all the numbers 0 up to m2, minus 1. And of course, there are m2 of these. And now we have a map from this set here um, to the product of these two sets. So the product of this set has m1, m2 elements, and this set has m1, m2 elements. And if we take a number x here, we can just map it to x modulo m1, x modulo m2. So we've got a map from two sets of the same size. And let's try and think about whether this is a bijection. Um, first of all, um, we, we note that it's an injection. Remember, this means that if x and y have the same image, this implies that x equals y. So let's just check this. So, so x maps to x mod m1 and x mod m2. And y maps to y modulo m1 and y modulo m2. And now we're saying these are the same image. So x modulo m1 is y modulo m1 and x modulo m2 is y modulo m2. So x minus y is divisible by m1 and m2. And since it's divisible by m1 and m2, it's also divisible by their product because m1 and m2 are co-prime. So x minus y is divisible by m1, m2. So x must be equal to y because we're taking them both to be in this set of coset representatives. Now, if we've got a map between two sets of the same size that's injective, then it must also be surjective. In other words, for every element here, there must be an element here mapping to it. So this shows that given any elements a1, m, and a2 um, in, in the pr 
so, so a1 would be in here and a2 is in here we can find an element here mapping to both of them so that's a sort of abstract existence argument for for the for the chinese remainder theorem so let's just write this right out an, as an example let's take m1 equals 3 and m2 equals 5 so what we have um we have the numbers from 0 to m1 m2 minus 1 so we get 0 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 11 12 13 14 and um so, so this is modulo m1 m2 and now we can have the modulo m1 which is 3 and we get 0 1 2 0 1 2 0 1 2 0 1 2 0 1 2 now we write them out as it modulo m2, which is 5, and get 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. And now you can see we get a bijection between these 15 numbers and these 15 pairs. For instance, you can see from this table that um, 1 mod 3 and 2 mod 5 corresponds to 7. And you can see that all these 15 pairs are different because that follows because three and five are co-prime and since there are 15 pairs and 15 numbers here we, we have to get a one-to-one -one correspondence between pairs and and numbers modulo 15. Um, if we do this with two numbers that aren't co-prime so let's try m1 equals 4 and m2 equals 6 say so we would have the numbers 0 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. I'm getting bored. Let's just go up to 23. And now we write them out modulo 4. So we get 0, 1, 2, 3, 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on. And again, I'm getting bored, so I won't do them all the way. And modulo 6, we get 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and so on. And now you notice that um, this map is neither injective nor surjective, because if you if you go up to the number 12 here we get 0 0 so um it's not it the the, the, the map from um the the, the, uh, the the problem is we've got two different um two different numbers modulo 24 that correspond to the same pair um so um uh, the, the number 0 and 12 of the same image so the map is not injective similarly the map isn't surjective because you notice that every pair we get here so um, if, if we pick any pair here you notice the elements are both even or both odd so we never get the pair 0 1 for example um, and this is the, the problem here is caused by the fact that m1 m2 are not co-prime obviously of highest common factor 2 so if if m1 and m2 are co-prime we get a nice bijection between numbers modulo m1 m2 and numbers modulo m1 times numbers modulo m2 if m1 and m2 are not co-prime then this map is neither injective nor surjective and we don't get um, a, a chinese remainder theorem so um so so let's look at um another example let's look at the equation x squared is equal to x modulo 10 to the n where i'm going to take some high power of 10 maybe a thousand or a million or something so we want to find what this says is we want to find numbers that remain the uh, have the same last digits if you square them for instance 6 squared is equal to 36 and now now you notice the last digit is the same so um so that 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 would be modulo 10 to the power of 1 on the we can also look at say 76 squared well this is equal to 5776 and now you notice that it is two digits that are the same at the end um and we can go on like this we can take a number like 17871093767 and if you square it, this will be something or other. 
um, ending with 178710936. So that would be modulo 10 to the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, would be modulo 10 to the 10. Um, and these aren't the only solutions. There's a trivial solution, naught squared is congruent to 0, modulo 10 to the n, and 1 squared is congruent to 1, modulo 10 to the n. These are, these are the kind of boring solutions. Um, there are still more solutions because we can look at 5 squared equals 25, and 25 squared equals 625. And if you look 625 squared, that's going to be something rather ending in 625. And we can go on like this. We get 8212890625 squared is equal to something rather 8212890625. So, so we really can get some slightly odd solutions for very large powers of, of n. And now we want to understand why this is true. So we want to solve x squared is common to x modulo 10 to the n. Well, what we do is we notice that 10 is not prime, it's 2 times 5. So this is the same as solving the two equations, x squared is common to x modulo 5 to the n, and x squared is common to x modulo 2 to the n, because of course, 5 to the n and 2 to the n are co-prime. So um, if, if we can solve these two equations, then by the Chinese remainder theorem, we can put the solutions together and solve this equation. And now let, let's solve these. x squared is common to x modulo 5 to the n. Well, that's easy to solve. It has two solutions, x equals 0 and x equals 1. Um, you may ask, does it have other solutions? Well, maybe. But it has at least two solutions. What about x squared is congruent to x modulo 2 to the n? Well, this has two obvious solutions. x is congruent to 0, x is congruent to 1. It may also actually have other solutions. Um, but we don't really... Sorry, that should be a 1. Um, we don't really worry about these. The, the, the point is we've got two solutions to this modulo x to the 5 and two solutions modulo 2 to the n, or at least two solutions. And now, <coughs> now we can find solutions by pairing these off. For instance, if we take these two solutions, we get the solution x is congruent to 0 modulo 10 to the n, which is not terribly exciting. And if we take these two solutions, we can get x is congruent to 1, modulo 10 to the n, which solves this, but isn't very exciting. But now we can do something a little bit cleverer. What we can do is we can take the cross solutions. So if we take x equals 0, modulo 2 to the n, and x is congruent to 1, modulo 5 to the n, then, um, um, then we get some other solutions. For example, this is now going to give us the solutions um, x equals... 6, which is 1 modulo 5 and 0 modulo 2, or we could take x equals 36, um, so x is congruent to 1 or 0 modulo, so here it's 1 modulo 5, um, and here it's um, 0 modulo 2, here it's 0 modulo 2 squared, um, and it's still 1 modulo 5 squared, uh, no, it isn't. Um, hold on. Uh, so, yeah, that should be a 76. So it's 1 modulo 5 squared. Um, and um, and so on. So, so if, if we take um, the, the next one along, which was 376, this is going to be 1 modulo 5 cubed, and it's going to be 0 modulo 2 cubed. And so you can keep going like this, and you can see you can keep on extending this number as long as you like because of the Chinese remainder theorem. We can also get the other solution by taking the other cross ratio. So we can take x corner to 0 modulo 5 to the n, and x is 1 modulo 2 to the n. And that gives us um, a, a, another set of solutions which look like 5, 25, 6, 25, and so on. There's actually another way of producing these particular solutions. We can just keep squaring. So 5 squared is equal to 25. 25 squared is equal to 6, 25. 6, 25 squared will be equal to something where we only care about the um, last few digits of. So it'd be 0, 6, 2, 5, with some digits before that. 
Um, and the reason why this works is suppose we've got a, suppose we've got a number x is congruent to 0 modulo 5 to the n, and x is congruent to 1 modulo 2 to the n. Well, then we notice that x squared is congruent to 0 modulo 5 to the n plus 1. In fact, modulo 5 to the 2n, but we only need 5 to the n plus 1. And x squared is congruent to, well, what's it congruent to 1 modulo modulo 2 to the n plus 1? Well, it's actually congruent to 1 modulo 2 to the n plus 1. And we see that because x is equal to 1 plus 2 to the n y. So x squared is equal to 1 plus 2 times 2 to the n um, y plus 2 to the n y squared and you can see this is divisible by 2 to the n plus 1. So if we've got any solution of um, x is congruent to 0 mod 5 to the n and x is congruent to 1 mod 2 to the n then squaring it we get a solution of this more uh, 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 of this equation with one extra digit. So every time we take one of these numbers and square it we get one extra digit um, to the solution of x squared is congruent to x modulo 10 to the n. So, so if we start with 5, we can just produce arbitrary long solutions by repeated squaring. Um, you may say, why don't we start with 6 and repeatedly square it? Well, that doesn't work, because if we start with 6 and square it, we get 6, 36, and 36 doesn't work. It's the number I was getting confused by down here. Um, so um, I just leave it as a question. Why does repeated squaring work if you start with 5, but not if you start with 6? Um, so um, let's just finish off by um, asking how many solutions are there modulo m. So we want to solve um, f of x is congruent to 0 modulo m for some polynomial. And we've seen we can reduce to prime powers using the Chinese remainder theorem. And now we want to know how many solutions are there. Well, um, the Chinese remainder theorem tells us this as well, because the number of solutions modulo mn for mn co prime is just the number of solutions modulo m times the number of solutions mod n. This is just essentially a restatement of the Chinese remainder theorem because if we've got every time we've got a solution modulo m and a solution modulo n, the Chinese remainder theorem says we get a solution modulo m n. So for example, let's try and work out um how many solutions to x squared is congruent to 1 modulo 680? Um, well, what we do is we write 680 as a product of primes. So we see it's got a factor of 5 and a factor of 2, and then we, we've got 68, which is 34, 17. So we've got 2 cubed times 5 times 17. So what we've got to do is we've got to solve three equations. x squared is congruent to 1 modulo 8, and x squared is congruent to 1 modulo 5, and x squared is congruent to 1 modulo 17. So let's work out the solutions. Well, x squared is congruent to 1 modulo 8. You remember this is this funny one that has more solutions than you expect. So it's a quadratic equation with four solutions. So the solutions are 1, 3, 5 and 7. And here, x squared is 1 mod 5. Well, that's pretty trivial. We just have 1 and minus 1. And x squared is 1 mod 17. Uh, sorry. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. So x squared equals 1 mod 17 um, has, again, it has two solutions, 1 and minus 1. Um, so um, we find there are four solutions mod 8 and there are two solutions modulo 5 and two solutions mod 17. So altogether, there are 16 square roots of 1 modulo 680. Um, OK, that's all about the Chinese remainder theorem. The next lecture will be about Euler's 
phi function or Euler's totient function.